In this series of videos, we've been talking about the gambler's fallacy as an example of a fallacy of reasoning with probabilities. I used it as a case study, or a lens, through which we could look more closely at the important probability concepts that underlie the fallacy, like the concepts of bias, independence, fairness, and randomness. This naturally led us to talk about the concept of a fair bet in actual gambling contexts, and how casinos make sure that players never encounter a fair bet. The expected value of a bet always favors the casino. And so far I've avoided talking about the rationality or irrationality of gambling per se because I don't think that we can make a blanket pronouncement like that. Gambling is a complex psychological and social phenomenon that millions of people participate in. There's something very exciting, very stimulating about wagering against chance and coming out the winner. There's no doubt that certain behaviors you commonly see, especially in casino gambling, can be viewed as systematically irrational. But it's not very illuminating to say that gambling as a whole is irrational. There are ways of gambling that are more or less rational. And there are cognitive biases that we are all prone to that can lead us to behave irrationally when we gamble. In this video, I'm going to take a closer look at some of these cognitive factors that play a role in explaining gambling behavior. I'm also very aware that this isn't just an academic exercise. Gambling can be habit forming and for some it becomes a powerful and destructive addiction. A lot of work has been done on the psychology of gambling because of the need to understand and treat so-called problem gambling, where the gambler has difficulty in limiting either the money or the time spent on gambling, leading to adverse effects. When you research the subject of cognitive biases in gambling, you'll find that a lot of studies are connected to research projects that are aimed at understanding and treating problem gambling. I want to highlight up front that I'm not an expert in any of this. But in what follows, I'm going to try to connect the discussion of probability fallacies and cognitive biases to the broader question of how to explain gambling behavior that becomes problematic and damaging to people. Obviously, there are a lot of factors that can influence gambling behavior. Here I want to focus attention on cognitive factors. And by that I mean beliefs and desires and patterns of reasoning that accompany and are associated with gambling behavior. At the end of the video, I'll come back and talk about other factors that play a role in gambling. But our focus here is on cognitive factors. These cognitive factors can be categorized in different ways. Here's one way. One factor at play are probability fallacies. These involve erroneous beliefs about the behavior of random devices and random sequences. Another factor are beliefs and behaviors that are sometimes grouped under the heading of illusions of control. These involve beliefs that a gambler has greater control over the outcomes of a random trial than they actually do. Gamblers can also be prone to selective recall and biased memories. If we tend to remember wins and ignore or forget about losses, we can build up a false internal model of how well we're doing. Then there are beliefs about personal attributes that are correlated with gambling success, like believing that some people are lucky or not lucky, or that certain ritual behaviors can influence success at the gambling table. I like to expand on all four of these, so we'll start with probability fallacies. If you've watched the earlier videos in the series, then you should be familiar by now with the gambler's fallacy. This involves the belief that random sequences are self-correcting, so that an unusually long sequence of heads on a coin toss implies that the next coin toss is more likely than not to land tails. As it applies to gambling, the common view is that a long series of losses implies that on the next round, you're more likely to win, that you're due to win, as though the gambling device has a memory of your history of losses. The hot hand fallacy is the flip side of the gambler's fallacy. The term comes from basketball, where a hot hand implies that someone is on a successful shooting streak, so that the next shot has a higher than average probability of sinking. But you can generalize it. In gambling, if you're having a good night at roulette, you might think that you're on a streak, that luck or skill is somehow with you in such a way that your chance of winning on the next round is higher than average. Another probability fallacy is the near miss fallacy. This involves the belief that if your loss was a near miss, like a slot machine draw being off by just one cherry, or a roulette spin landing right next to the slot you bet on, then on the next round, your winning choice is more likely to come up. It's as though you think that the near miss is evidence that chance is aiming at that particular outcome. So you have a higher expectation that it will win than if the miss was wide of the mark. This isn't an exhaustive list of probability fallacies that are relevant to gambling. But let's move on now to illusions of control. This term was coined by the psychologist Ellen Langer, who was responsible for many of the key experiments that stimulated work in this area. 
Illusions of control involve beliefs where someone overestimates their ability to influence the outcome of a chance event. In many cases, we have no ability to influence the outcome, yet we may come to believe that we have some control over it, and even that we can develop skill in the exercise of this control. There are several different lines of evidence that demonstrate this effect. One famous experiment involves giving the subject a button to push. There are two lights, one labeled score, the other no score. On a particular round, either the score or the no score light will light up. The subject can hit the button or not hit the button at the start of each round. The subject's task is to determine whether the choice to hit or not hit the button has any influence on how likely either one of the lights will light up. Now you can set this up so that the pattern of lights is completely random and unconnected to anything that the subject does. Though you can also set it up so that hitting the button does have some probabilistic effect on which light goes on. The result is interesting. People have a range of judgments about how much control they have over the lights, but these judgments have almost no correlation with the actual control that they have. What seems to anchor their judgment the most is how often the score light goes on. If it lights up frequently, they think they have more control over the sequence than if it lights up less frequently. So it seems like when one of the outcomes is conceptualized as a success outcome, then our brains tend to fixate on this outcome. We come to think we have more control over success outcomes than outcomes that aren't conceptualized as success outcomes. Here's another interesting phenomenon. When gamblers throw dice in a game, like craps, it turns out that when they want a higher dice roll, they throw the dice harder than when they want a lower dice roll. Our brains and our bodies associate the outcomes of a dice roll with a variable that we have control over. Here's another famous experiment. Subjects are given the task of predicting the outcome of 30 coin tosses. They're not shown the toss. They're only given feedback on whether the toss landed heads or tails. The feedback was rigged so that each subject was told that they got the right answer exactly half the time. So they had 15 successful guesses out of 30. They were told whether they predicted correctly immediately after each toss, but the subjects were told different things about where their hits occurred. One group of subjects was told that their early guesses were accurate, that they had guessed correctly in the first four coin tosses. Others were told that their successes were distributed evenly across the 30 trials. And another group was told that their successes occurred near the end. Afterward, the subjects were asked to estimate how successful they were at predicting the outcomes and how successful they think they would be in future guessing games like this. The results, as always, are fascinating. The group who was told that they had success early on in the test overestimated their total number of successful predictions and had higher expectations for how they would perform on future guessing games than the other subjects in the test. So the early hits seem to generate a kind of primacy effect where information given early in the sequence tends to dominate a person's judgments. The other startling result was that 40% of all the participants said that they thought their performance would improve with practice, and 25% thought that their performance would be hampered by distraction, even though the task was to predict a chance outcome, a random coin toss. So the upshot of this line of research is fairly discouraging. We can easily come to believe that chance outcomes can be subject to conscious, intentional control. Early successes, early wins, can lead to an attribution of skill, the belief that the successes are due in part to the exercise of skill. And we can come to believe this even when outcomes are genuinely random and there is no correlation between anything we do and the actual pattern of outcomes. And finally, though we haven't shown all the evidence for this here, there is a tendency to explain successes as resulting from the exercise of skill and failures as resulting from external factors that are outside of a person's control. No one is immune to these illusions of control. But you can see how casinos and gambling scenarios are a natural habitat for these illusions. Let's turn now to the third item on our list of cognitive factors, selective recall and biased memories. This is a general phenomenon. We see it everywhere. We don't have equal access to all events in our memory. Some types of events get priority, and we remember them more easily than other types of events. In general, it's easier to recall memories that reinforce our beliefs, hopes, and expectations. This is particularly problematic in gambling situations because it can result in people remembering their wins and forgetting their losses. We won't forget all our losses, of course. What happens is that we end up with a skewed perception of our successes and failures. We think we're doing better than we actually are, 
and this can lead us to continue to gamble long past the point where we should stop. A lot of gamblers have the experience of being shocked to learn how much they spent after the fact because in their minds they believed they were doing better than that, but they weren't paying attention to the actual tally. The final type of cognitive factor that we'll talk about are beliefs about personal attributes. Some of this can fit into the other categories, but what we're talking about are beliefs that personal attributes or traits or certain kinds of ritualistic behaviors can increase a person's chances of winning. Luck itself can be regarded as a personal attribute. We can come to believe that people are just lucky or unlucky, or that luck can come and go. We might believe in lucky tokens or charms, that having a certain coin in our pocket or wearing a certain ring can bring us luck. This overlaps with the broader category of superstitious behaviors and beliefs. A lot of gamblers will say that they try to recreate conditions that they associate with success. And it could be as arbitrary as touching the button on a slot machine three times before hitting it, or wearing the same pair of socks. Some will say they associate winning or losing with seeing a bird on their windowsill that morning, or taking a particular route to the casino. Another category is a belief in the power of fate, that fate is poised to intervene and bring happiness to one's life. In cultures where ancestor worship is common, one often sees luck and gambling associated with the intervention of dead ancestors. And this leads us into the category of spiritual and religious beliefs, especially as they relate to expectations about the power of prayer or positive thinking to bring about positive changes to one's life. This is a diverse list of beliefs, but what they have in common is the notion that the person walking into the casino believes they carry with them certain attributes that are attached to that person. Maybe it's luck, maybe it's fate, maybe it's having performed the requisite rituals, whatever, and they believe that these attributes can have an influence on whether they win or lose on that day. So that's our list of some of the cognitive factors that can influence gambling behavior. Now, I don't want people to think that this list by itself gives us an explanation for problem gambling. Like I said at the start, gambling is a complex phenomenon, and what we've been talking about here is only a part of the picture. We've been focusing on a certain aspect of the problem, the cognitive component, but we know it can't be the whole story, because everyone is prone to these cognitive biases. To some extent, they're universal. So they can't, by themselves, explain why gambling becomes pathological for some but not for others. They don't give us a clear picture of what distinguishes the casual gambler from the pathological gambler. For example, we haven't talked about the role of emotions. One thing that gamblers commonly report is struggling with what is sometimes called cognitive regret. Regret over stopping prematurely and missing out on the next win. And feelings of entrapment, like feeling like you have to maintain a course of action because you've already invested so much to date, and you need to keep going to recover your losses. Another approach to the psychology of gambling is based on behavioral learning theory models, which say that our behavior is governed by patterns of positive and negative reinforcement. Winning money generates excitement, which leads to continued play being rewarded. Gambling can also put people into a dissociative state. You can zone out. That lets them temporarily escape from negative feelings or stress related to work or family or other issues. And this can play a role in reinforcing continued play. Gambling environments can become triggers for states of arousal and excitement, so that even seeing a flashing light or a pair of dice or a casino sign can trigger the urge to gamble. There's also research on the neurophysiology of addiction that can shed light on pathological gambling. Addiction models target the changes in brain chemistry and function that often accompany addiction, and pathological gambling is the best candidate for a behavioral disorder that qualifies as addiction. It's addiction without a drug, but it's still addiction. Serotonin levels are linked to impulse control, noradrenaline is linked to arousal, uh, the neurochemistry that Im impacts dopamine levels is linked to reward and reinforcement, mood, decision making, and so forth. Now, it's likely that the neurophysiology of gambling addiction is also going to show some differences from substance addiction, but it's still obviously an important piece of the puzzle. And finally, my brief review of the literature strongly suggests that the frontier in this area is integrated studies and modeling. And by that I mean looking at correlations between brain functioning, for example, and susceptibility to the sorts of cognitive fallacies and distortions that we've been looking at in this video. Or correlations between personality traits like impulsivity and susceptibility to problem gambling. Luke Clark and others are pushing this integrated approach, and it seems to me that this is where the field has to go. So summing up, here's what I wanted to accomplish with this video. 
I wanted to show how the gambler's fallacy and other fallacies of probabilistic reasoning play a role in explaining actual gambling behavior. To do this, I tried to show how they relate to the broader class of cognitive factors that are known to play a role in the psychology of gambling. But I didn't want to suggest that we'll fix these problems simply by educating people about probability theory. Critical thinking about gambling certainly requires that we understand these cognitive distortions. But gambling behavior, like any human behavior, has neurological and physiological as well as cognitive components. We need to understand how these interact to really understand what's going on.